nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, so let's uh, get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Strachan. I'm a professor of material science here at Purdue University. And uh, we're very excited to have a new uh, workshop in our uh, series of uh, hands-on workshops on machine learning and data science. Um, today's uh, presentation, uh, we're very excited to have Dr. Ar Arun Manodi Kanakitodi uh, talking about uh, machine learning for uh, defect energetics in semiconductors. Um, Arun is a, a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne National Lab, and his interests are in uh, artificial intelligence-driven design of uh, new materials. And uh, I'm very happy to say that Arun will uh, join our uh, School of Materials Engineering as an assistant professor uh, next month. Uh, so we're very uh, happy to have him, Arun, as a colleague, and I'm extremely happy to welcome him uh, uh, for for today's uh, workshop. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Saket Desai. Uh, he's the uh, co-organizer with me of this series. He's done a lot of work, and all the NanoHub team that is enabling us to enable uh, this uh, 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 workshop. Uh, so, without further ado, Arun, uh, we're all yours. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Strachan. Uh, I ap appreciate uh, a lot your invitation uh, for this workshop, and I'm very excited uh, to to share this material with uh, everyone. So, uh, yeah, and thanks for trying to pronounce my name uh, as well. So, uh, my name is Arun. I'm currently uh, a postdoc. Uh, postdoctoral researcher at Argonne, and I will be uh, starting an assistant professor position in materials engineering at Purdue next month. So uh, I'm uh, very excited to share this work with, with, with everyone. Uh, so what I thought I would do is spend a few minutes giving an overview of this work uh, before jumping into the Jupyter Notebook, where we can step-by-step step go through the different uh, uh, steps involved in, 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 in doing this work. So the idea here is uh, creating a machine learning framework for predicting uh, impurity properties or defect properties in semiconductors. Uh, typically, uh, what we do here is uh, we use these quantum mechanical calculations to study different types of properties, and we combine that with uh, you know some sort of machine learning or data science framework where. Uh, uh, we have models which can learn from the computational data. So this computational data is expensive. So we have models which can learn from this data and uh, give you, uh, you know, these accurate statistical models, which can, you know, within a certain percentage of accuracy, it can make the predictions at the same level of theory that you're using. So that is the basic idea behind the work. Uh, in terms of impurities or defects in semiconductors, they are very important. Uh, 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 the, the energy levels created by these defects and impurities especially are very important. So this is a simple band diagram of, of, of a semiconductor. Uh, you could have these energy levels uh, being shallow, which means they are close to the band edges, or they could be deep inside the band gap. And if they are deep, uh, they have major consequences for photovoltaic applications, quantum information sciences, etc. For example, these deep levels could act as uh, non-radiative recombination centers for charge carriers, which would adversely affect the photovoltaic efficiency, but they could also act as intermediate bands for increased absorption, which would have a positive effect on, on the photovoltaic efficiency. Uh, and these uh, energy levels of atomic impurities have also been shown to uh, that they can be used as qubit for quantum computing. So there are a lot of possible applications, and we want to accurately predict these energy levels created by defects and impurities. So experimentally, uh, people use uh, uh, methods like uh, deep level transient spectroscopy or cathodoluminescence to do this, but sample preparation can be difficult, and it's also difficult to assign observed levels to a particular defect. So the way out here is performing density functional theory calculations, uh, DFT. It's, it's a 
it, it's a first principles modeling technique where we uh, you know use quantum mechanics to solve for the structure and properties of, of materials. So uh, here we can use DFT to calculate the energetics of defects and impurities, but we require large supercells and charged states which make these calculations very expensive. And generally prior knowledge is not utilized for new defect levels. So to solve this problem, uh, we uh, propose this framework of predicting impurity behavior by combining density functional theory and machine learning. So here I'm showing a particular semiconductor in a zinc blend structure, and this black atom here is the impurity atom. And these equations can be solved by from DFT to get the formation energy of this impurity as a function of the charge Q, as a function of the chemical potential nu, uh, the Fermi level E underscore F, and there is a correction energy term at the end, which takes into account periodic interaction between charges. So uh, you don't need to know more, uh, too many details of this, but the important thing to know is that solving these equations uh, gives us plots like this, like you can see here. This is the formation energy of different defects in cadmium telluride, for example, a cadmium interstitial defect or a cadmium vacancy defect, etc., as a function of the Fermi level. The slope of these lines it gives you the stable charge state of the defect. And these points where the slope changes uh, are actually the impurity transition levels or impurity levels, epsilon Q1 to Q2. That is what we desire here. So if we have a, a DFT data set of these impurity properties, we can use a framework like this to create this machine learning uh, uh, framework where we convert all our input data points, which are basically semiconductor plus impurity. Uh, we can use descriptors like the elemental properties of the impurity atom, the coordination environment around the impurity atom, uh, cheaper DFT calculations, etc. And we can map these descriptors to the DFT computed properties, and we can train these machine learning models, uh, you know, simple linear models or, you know, uh, more com complicated non-linear regression models like random forest or neural networks, etc. And we can end up with these machine learning models, which can make on-demand predictions, and we don't need to do these expensive DFT calculations anymore. So that is the idea here. And to quickly show you how accurate these DFT calculations are with respect to experiments, what I'm plotting here are for a few selected impurity transition levels or defect transition levels. In cadmium telluride, I have the experimental levels in red, and uh, I have the two levels of DFT theory, the PB, which is the standard level of theory, and the hybrid HSE, which is a more advanced level of theory. So what we see here is that the root mean square error between the PBE calculations and the experiments are about 0.22 electron volts. And actually, the, the advanced level of theory uh, gives us, you know, uh, results that are really off in a couple of cases, but if we remove those, the HSE predictions are also pretty good, but they are two orders of magnitude more expensive than the PB calculations. So what I want to emphasize here is that we generate a data set using the PB functional because, you know, this is a pretty reasonable accuracy given the limitations of DFT itself. Uh, so if we can get machine learning models with a similar prediction accuracy, we can replace these DFT computations and we can perform accelerated screening. So uh, I'm going to get into the actual notebook very soon. But before that, I want to show the different steps that are involved in training this sort of a material to property regression model. So these are the different steps that uh, we used in, in our work. So we start by reading the data. So the data is basically the, the labels, which are, you know, a given semiconductor, a given impurity and the defect site. Uh, and then their computed properties, which are their computed impurity formation energies and impurity transition levels, and then the different descriptors that go into training the machine learning model. So I'm going to demonstrate the notebook using one of the properties, which is just the uh, formation energy. Uh, that's all I have time for today. So uh, the, the next thing would be to select a machine learning technique. So, you know, you could do a simple linear regression. You could do a last regression. You could do kernel ridge regression, random forest, neural network, etc. You can start by training a default model. So I will be using Python, uh, the scikit-learn package in Python for everything. So you can, they have pre-installed, uh, you know, uh, uh, packages for all these techniques and you just need to know how to all the relevant packages and how to, you know, do different steps to train the model. So for example, you can read the data in input, uh, you can call a random forest model and ask it to train a default model with a 70-30 training split or an 80-20 training split or a whatever. So this will give you a model and then you can say that, you know, perhaps I can improve the performances here by going deeper into this model. That's when you look at other factors such as hyperparameter optimization, cross-validation, learning curves, etc. 
So, you know, I will uh, talk about, uh, you know, optimizing the different hyperparameters and performing cross-validation, which helps, you know, minimize the overfitting in the, in the data, et cetera, when I show the notebook. Uh, another thing you want to keep in mind is learning curves, which is where you plot your prediction error as a function of the training data and until your error converges. So you know you have enough data points. So that's not something I will go into today, but that's something to, to keep in mind. And finally, after you are done doing all these steps, you can deploy your best model to make new predictions and discovery. So that's what I want to emphasize here. Uh, this is what my data set looks like. So here, uh, uh, in terms of semiconductors, I'm looking at three types of semiconductors. In the first column, you can see cadmium telluride, cadmium selenide, and cadmium sulfide. So you will see different points belonging to different semiconductors. Uh, and going forward, I will also consider alloys of these semiconductors. So I will talk about that later. In all these semiconductors, you have different defect sites or doping sites, like the tellurium site, cadmium site, selenium site, or interstitial sites. So MI means the interstitial site, and there are different types of interstitial sites as well. So that's the next column. And the third column is what the defect atom is or the impurity atom is. Nitrogen, oxygen, beryllium, mercury, uh, sulfur, etc. So, so you have different uh, types of these uh, defect atoms. And the next three columns are the computed formation energy values. So these are the neutral state formation energy values at three different chemical potential conditions. So we want to train models for all these three different properties. And then the next columns are the computed charge transition levels. So we consider six types of charge transitions from plus three to plus two, plus two to plus one, all the way to minus two to minus three. So this may be confusing if you're not familiar with, you know, what these properties really represent. But all you need to know is in the end, I have uh, two data sets. So one data set is the formation energies or the formation enthalpies, three, uh, three types of formation enthalpies, which the data set size is 945. And the second data set are these six transition levels, which we combine together, and we end up with a data set of two to eight, six points. So we train machine learning models, you know, which give, takes information about the, the input and gives you this output, you know, uh, using this data set. Uh, so uh, quickly, uh, to show the descriptors that I use, uh, these are just uh, coefficients of linear correlation between these nine properties and different descriptors. So these are, uh, in, in the beginning, these are the, uh, uh, elemental properties of the impurity atoms. So these are simply the atomic uh, radii, the ionic radii, electro, electron affinity, electronegativity, et cetera. And the properties at the end are these uh, unit cell defect calculations, which instead of doing these supercell calculations, we do cheaper unit cell calculations and we obtain some information from these cheaper calculations, which we use as descriptors. So the, the more dark is, is a box here, the higher is the correlation between that particular descriptor and the property. So this sort of gives you a qualitative idea of which descriptors are important. Uh, so, you know, this is for this data set of 381 impurities uh, that, that I have. Uh, uh, this is what the descriptors look like. So for the same data labels that I showed before, you have these different descriptors, uh, you know, delta ionization energy, delta atomic radii, et cetera. Uh, to learn more about what the descriptors exactly are, you can check out the publication. Uh, so what I want to uh, say here is that I have three sets of descriptors. The first set of descriptors is 14 in number. The next set is five in number. And the third set is a combination of these two, which is 19 in number. So I will demonstrate what happens if I train the model just with elemental properties, or if I train the model with unit cell defect properties. So you can see here that the unit cell defect properties are actually much more correlated with the prop uh, with the properties of interest than these elemental properties. So you would expect those to be more important than the elemental properties. So we will see, you know, how the performance of the regression models change when we go from elemental properties to unit cell defect properties to using both of them together. So uh, just to quickly show uh, a couple of regression techniques that I use here are random forest regression. So random forest contains, uh, you know, a set of decision trees. You know, you can define the number of trees, also called the number of estimators, and the number of nodes that go into each of the trees and the number of features that go into each of these trees. And you train, uh, you know, you optimize different parameters at the different nodes, and you get predictions out of all these different trees. And an average or a mean of all these predictions gives you the actual prediction. And if you take the standard deviation of these different predictions, it also gives you the error bar or the uncertainty in the prediction. So this is roughly how random forest regression works. 
Another technique that I will talk about is kernel regression, which is a similarity-based regression technique. So if you have a chemical space like this, where every X point is basically the descriptors or the input quantity that represents that point, the, the difference between or the distance between any two points is a measure of the similarity, which is given by this Euclidean distance. And the property is defined as a weighted sum of Gaussians, where this distance is, is one of the factors. And you have to optimize the parameters alpha or A and, and sigma and you optimize these parameters and you end up with a model which will give you the predictions. So these are two particular regression techniques that I'll show you the results for. So I think we can uh, get into the notebook now. I have spent uh, 10 minutes, slightly more than 10 minutes on these slides. So uh, if, uh, uh, if you guys have not launched the Jupyter 2 yet, so you can do that at this stage. Uh, log into your NanoHub account, go to this particular URL, nanohub.org uh, uh, slash resources slash ML defect. ML defect is the name of the tool. Click on launch tool and you know it will open the notebook that I want to show. And you should reach this page. So uh, 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 Ali and Saket, uh, when you give me the go ahead, I can start uh, 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 I can start working through the notebook. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say uh, yeah, I would encourage all of you to try to run uh, this cell uh, with Arun. Um, it, not, the, the Nano Hub accounts are free. Uh, I think we're we're good to go, uh, Arun. Um, yeah. Okay. Everyone should be able to follow. Remember, in Jupiter, uh, when you go to a code cell, this is a text cell, a cell with with just text. But when you if you have a code cell, you have to click Shift plus Enter to run the code cell, and that's what Arun will be doing. Uh, to walk through the uh, code. Yeah. Uh, I think we can start that on. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So, at this point, I, I neglected to do that before, but I really want to thank Saket a lot. So, Saket Desai, uh, Professor Straka and student, he helped me a lot with the notebook and with, you know, the technical details of, you know, using NanoHub, uh, you know, making sure this is published and available to everyone on NanoHub. So uh, shout out to, to Saket, who's a very smart uh, graduate student. Uh, so thanks to him for, for all his help. So I think I can go ahead and get started. So uh, th there's a lot of information on this notebook and it will be available to you, to everyone. So please, I encourage you to, to keep, uh, you know, playing around with the notebook even after the tutorial. Uh, th there's a lot of information on the parameters that you can change and how all the things that you can change. You can input your own data and train models. You can visualize different things. You can change parameters of different uh, models, etc. So that's what the purpose of, of this notebook would be uh, since, since you guys have access to it. So here is just some information about, you know, the, the science that goes into uh, the, 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 uh, the notebook. So assuming everyone has been able to open this, this Jupyter notebook, so, uh, so remember the idea is to train the DFT data that I talked about to, you know, read the descriptors along with the data to define different machine learning models, optimize them and, you know, deploy them. So we start with importing some standard Python libraries. So you would see some standard libraries like NumPy, uh, random pandas, etc., cetera, uh, matplotlib. So, so that's what I'll do at first. So I, I ran that cell. So I have imported these uh, libraries. Uh, next, so I separated out the scikit-learn libraries, uh, you know, just to, to demonstrate. So, so scikit-learn is, is the Python module which has all these uh, machine learning or data science uh, packages that, that, that we can use. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, import scikit-learn, and then from scikit-learn, I'm going to import different things like linear model, cross-validate, linear regression, random forest regressor, uh, grid search CV, et cetera. All of these things will be going into the training of the models that I'll demonstrate. So I'm going to run this cell as well. So that's done. So I have imported all the modules that I desired. Next, uh, here is a markdown where I describe the nature of the data set and what exactly I'm reading. So I want to uh, emphasize here that I will be reading three different data files. Uh, so, so they will be called data, outside, and x. Uh, so those uh, data.csv, outside.csv, those are the files that I will be reading. Uh, so, or, uh, you know, there'll be two versions of each of these files. Uh, so there'll be data.csv and there'll be a data norm.csv where I have normalized the descriptors. So uh, sometimes we need to uh, normalize these descriptors, in, uh, you know, before uh, training these machine learning models. But, you know, some of these models have the ability to 
to take care of the normalization themselves. But to be safe, I'm using uh, the normalized data set here. So what I'm doing here is I'm reading this data norm.csv file, which contains all the labels that I talked about. It contains the properties. So this is for the formation energy. So it contains three types of formation energies, which are three different chemical potential conditions. So you have cadmium rich delta H, you have uh, moderate delta H, and you have X rich delta H. So these are the three properties. So for the time being, I'm just going to take cadmium rich delta H. So I've commented out the other two lines. I'm just reading this one property. Uh, next, the next columns are the descriptors. Okay, so here I'm going to ask you to, to, to work this along with me. So uh, the, the, the first set of descriptors are just the elemental properties. The next set are the unit cell defect properties. And the third set are both of them together. So I'm going to start with just the elemental properties. So I encourage you to uncomment this first line for the elemental properties and comment out the other two lines. So your X, your, disc, your descriptors should be these 14 dimensions from column 6 to column 20, which are the elemental properties of the impurity atom. So that's the only information that goes into uh, training this machine learning model. Uh, the next uh, the, the data file that I re read is something called outside dot csv or outside norm dot csv so these contain new calculations that i did which will not be seen by the uh, by the machine learning algorithms at all but i'm going to make predictions on these so these are specifically alloy data so all the data that i have are on three compounds cadmium telluride cadmium selenide and cadmium sulfide so in addition to that i performed some new calculations on cadmium Telluride selenide and cadmium selenide sulfide. So these are uh, new compounds, but they're still in the same chemical space. So one would expect these machine learning models to work for those compounds as well. So I have some new DFT data that I read as part of this outside uh, uh, file. So again, these are the labels of, of the data, and this is the property. So I'm going to comment out these two lines, and I read the first line, which is the cadmium-rich chemical potential uh, uh, delta H. So that's the property that I'm reading here. Uh, the, the, the three lines that you see here for X out are the descriptors. So once again, please comment out this last line and uncomment the first line. So you want to be reading the descriptors from column 6 to column 20. So these give you the elemental properties again. Uh, so these are the elemental property descriptors. So, so that's what we, we, we are going to be using here. Uh, for the time being. So, so I, I read the elemental property descriptors here. And the third file that I read is called x.csv or xnorm.csv. So this actually includes every possible impurity in the chemical space. So this contains thousands of points. So my data set is actually a few hundred points or something. And then there are thousands of possible impurities. So once I have an accurate model, this is the power of machine learning where I can now make predictions for hundreds or thousands or millions of new cases you know, in the same chemical space, assuming the models are applicable to those. So uh, here I read the labels of these points and then I read the X values, which are the descriptors. So please comment this last uh, line and uncomment this uh, line uh, where it is reading just the elemental properties from column three to column 70. So hopefully everyone got a hang of that. Uh, so in this column, I'm reading the data. I'm going to run this. So it has run. So now it has read the data file, the outside file, and the X files. All right. So that's all done. So this particular cell is <clears throat> just a simple way to visualize the data if you're interested. So for example, here, I'm just visualizing the property that I have with the 12th dimension of, of the descriptors. So if I run this, uh, it gives me this, this you know plot, which is the property versus descriptor. So you can change this dimension as you like. If you want to look at the fifth dimension, you know you can run this. And it gives you this plot. So, so you know, so you don't really see much correlation here. So, so some of these descriptors may be uncorrelated, you know, but but you know, some some of the others may not be, and together, you know, they may give you enough information. So, so this is again something you can play around with just to you know look at what the data is. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna get into the, the the weeds of the of training the machine learning model now. So the first thing that I do here is this training test split. So uh, you have a you know a data set of a few hundred points or a thousand points or whatever. So you know to begin with, what I want to do is I want to uh, train an 80-20 training test split. So what that means is 80% of my data set would be used for training the model, and 20% would be used for evaluating how good the model is. The 20% will not be seen by the model. So uh, if you come to this section here, t equal to 0.2, uh, you know means uh, it uses 
0.2 fraction of the data set for, for, uh, for as the test set. And this train test split function that you see here splits the data into this 80 20 fraction. And then, you know, the rest are just, you know, uh, additional things to define the training and the test data sets uh, in the appropriate format. So you can run this section with, without uh, making any changes. And this will split your data and give you these property train, property test, x train, x test files. Uh, you know, in an 80-20 fraction. Okay, so assuming uh, all of that works so far, everything is working well for people, uh, uh, let's try to train uh, a regression model now. So, so we'll start by training a regression model to predict the property of interest, which is the impurity formation energy at cadmium-rich conditions. Uh, the simple linear regression is what I'm going to start with. So, so this is ordinary least squares regression. So if you come uh, to this cell, you will see... Uh, how I, I go about training this linear regression model. So, so this is uh, uh, something to define the parameter grid. So I'm not defining any parameter grid here. So I'm just going to assume, uh, uh, I'm just going to ask it to take the default parameters, whatever it, it needs. So I'm uh, using this uh, grid search CV function, which is what I will keep using going forward. So this is, is a function that takes your hyperparameter space optimizes it and gives you the best possible parameters. So here I did not provide anything, so this is not strictly relevant. Uh, but what, what, what I'm passing here is the linear regression module that I read from, from uh, scikit-learn. So, so I have this linear regression module. Uh, so I, I define this, I use this fit function. So OLS is my ordinary least square regressor here. And I pass, uh, I pass the training data, which is the X train, uh, which means the descriptors, and the property train, which is you know my formation energy. I pass these two uh, 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 data sets through this fit function on an OLS. So this fits me a linear regression model. And once it fits the model, it's going to make predictions. So it can, it will make predictions on the training set, which is what I call pred train, and it makes predictions on the test set, which is what I call pred test. So it fits the model and makes these predictions. And then I can print out the best parameters to visualize what, whatever it used. And I can uh, save these predicted data as CSV files or, or you know, text files or whatever format you prefer. So, so that's what's happening here. And then I can print out the root mean square error of the predictions. So this is how I, I do that. So I look at the test root mean square error, with the actual test values and the predicted test values. And I look at the training root mean square error with the actual training values and the predicted training values. And finally, uh, I have all these results. Now I can plot the regression results. So, uh, you know, this is just, you know, a bunch of lines that describe how I'm plotting it. I'm, you know, titling it a linear regression model. I'm plotting the uh, ML predictions versus the DFT predictions. And I'm also going to print out the, the root mean square errors on this plot. So uh, let's run this cell. So, so I'm running this cell. So it, it ran pretty quickly. Uh, and it gave me a linear regression model. So you can see that this is there's a pretty ter terrible model. So you know the the lack of correlations that we were looking at earlier are you know probably uh, serious. So so these uh, you know these particular descriptors that we read so far do not give me a very good model. So the formation energy values sort of go from zero EV to eight EV, and the 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 prediction errors you know they lie very far away from this parity line. And these root mean square errors are very large. They are 1.5 EV errors. So these uh, you know, predictions on the training points and the test points are both pretty awful. So, so something is not right here. Either the regression algorithm is not good enough, or the descriptors are not good enough, or maybe you don't have enough data. So one of the things we can change is to change the descriptors that we're using. So I ask you to come back to this uh, cell, the reading data cell. So hopefully I'm not going too fast and people are able to follow this along. So please come back to the reading data cells where we write the three data files. And here, instead of reading the elemental properties, uh, comment out that line of the elemental properties and, uh, and uncomment this uncomment the second line, which is the unit cell defect properties. So now I'm going to read these five dimensions, which are the unit cell defect properties, and I'm going to see if that make, uh, improves my performances or not. Uh, similarly, uh, come down here, uh, comment this line, which is the elemental properties, uncomment the unit cell defect properties, come down to the x.csv file, comment this line, and uncomment the, elemental, uh, the, the unit cell defect properties. Now let's run this cell again. 
So it, it runs this again. Uh, you know, you can visualize the data also, but I'm not going to do that again. Uh, come down to the training test split and run this again. So it, it splits the data into an 80-20 training test split. Now let me run this linear regression model again. And when I do this, I see that, voila, the predictions are much better. So, you know, so so uh, you can see that the, the points have become much tighter on the parity line. So clearly, you know, the unit cell defect properties have information that the elemental properties did not have. So, so that's what's going on here. And there is, uh, you know, a higher degree of correlation between these unit cell descriptors and the, and the, you know, the, the formation energy that you're trying to predict. So now I see that my test uh, predictions are about 0.57 EV and my training predictions are 0.55 EV. So, you know, that's not an awful prediction. You know, even a linear regression model does, does pretty well. So I will ask you guys to come back up again one final time, and then we are done with this with this part. So I will ask you to uh, comment this unit cell defect property line and uncomment this line where it's taking the elemental properties and the unit cell properties together. Uh, so again, come down here, comment this line, uncomment this one, uh, come down to the x.csv file, uh, comment this line, uncomment this. So now it's it's uh, reading these uh, 19 uh, 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 dimension descriptors, which include both the elemental properties and the unit cell properties, come down to the training test split cell and run that again. Uh, now it has split the data again into an 80-20 split, run this linear regression model again, and it gives you the prediction. So it gives you actually a very similar prediction. So you know that there is a great degree of linear correlation between these unit cell properties, which shows you that you know the elemental properties are perhaps not as important for predicting the impurity formation energies. They do become more important for the charge function levels, which is why I keep them here. But uh, you know for the formation energies, it looks like the 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 the, the unit cell defect uh, descriptors are actually pretty good. Uh, you know for for giving these predictions. Okay, so we have seen how the linear regression model uh, behaves, and we have seen that you know by adding more useful descriptors, you can improve these predictions. Now let's go, let's go uh, and try to improve these predictions even further. So this is is the simplest kind of model. It's just a linear model. So you know, surely some of these relationships would be nonlinear, and we don't really know what these relationships are. So to do that, I'm going to demonstrate a, a particular nonlinear regression model, which is random forest, which I talked about during my presentation. So here I have a bunch of information about random forest. So the first step that I do here is to train a default model with random forest. So I do not provide any parameters. I'm just going to ask it to take whatever parameters it wants. And I'm not going to use any cross validation yet. But, uh, you know, here, once again, I call this random forest regressor. I use the fit function and pass the training data to it. I make the predictions. I use the predict function to make predictions on the training and the test uh, sets. I can save these predictions uh, as CSV files. I can uh, get the root mean square error predictions, as you can see here, and I can finally plot the data. So let's go ahead and run this particular cell. So this should only take a few seconds. Okay, so so this has you know uh, I have run run this model and I, I get a prediction here. So I see that my predictions improve slightly. My training predictions actually go down a lot, but you know my test predictions, uh, you know with the linear regression model it was about 0.57 EV. Now I'm looking at 0.51 EV. So you know these predictions have become good, but you can see uh, that you know if you guys are familiar with overfitting, so overfitting is when the model fits you know very perfectly with, to the training data, but it doesn't learn you know it good enough to make the predictions for the test data, which is outside data, which is data that it has not looked at. So clearly, something of that sort is happening here because ideally, you want your test uh, error and your training error to be very similar. You know, you want them to be around the same magnitude. So here, the training error is much better, and the test error is not as good. So what that means is we want to use some, you know, some more fancier things. You know, we 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 want to optimize some of the hyperparameters and see if that makes a difference. We want to use cross validation. So cross validation is when uh, it you know it, it divides your training data into different sets. So for example, if I'm doing five-fold cross-validation, it takes my 80% training data and it divides that data itself into five sets. And it may it uses four of the of the sets or four of the subsets to make a prediction and tests it on the fifth set. And it, it does this multiple times and it averages out the error. So this kind of makes sure that it is making good predictions on all the points. So every single point would have acted 
as a training point and as a cross validation point at, at different stages. So that is the idea behind doing cross validation. Uh, and those are the techniques that we can use to, to make these, uh, uh, to improve these predictions. Okay, so I want everyone to come down to this next cell, which is what I call the random forest second run. So here I'm just going to do hyperparameter optimization. I'm not even going to go into cross validation yet. So uh, as I talked about in my slides, uh, there are different hyperparameters that are important for random forest, such as the number of estimators or the number of trees, uh, the maximum depth of every tree, the maximum features that can go into you know, any, any one tree, the, the minimum number of samples that can go into a node, the minimum number of samples that are split, et cetera. So there are many different types of hyperparameters that you can use here. And uh, this is a big field of study in itself. And I don't have too much time to go into the details, but there are a few things that you need to keep in, keep in mind. So you would notice that I have provided a bunch of values here, like I'm saying, let the number of estimators be 50, 100, or 200, let the maximum depth be 5, 10, or 15, and so on. So how would I know what to initialize this with? So this is something that you know comes from a little bit of experience or comes from a lot of trial and error, or perhaps. So for this particular problem, I have tested out you know a lot of different hyperparameters, and I know that my optimal hyperparameters sort of lie in these ranges that I'm using here. So that is how I get this information. But uh, I should mention that hyperparameter optimization is a very big field in itself, and you know it becomes especially complicated when you go to neural networks. There are a lot of other parameters that you need to optimize, and there are many different uh, tools available. Like for example, at Argon, we have this tool called Deep Hyper, which can optimize the number of uh, you know hidden layers, nodes in the hidden layers, the number of epochs, etc., that you need to use for neural networks. So there are a lot of resources out there that you know, specifically solve this problem for you. But I'm going to use a pretty simple uh, thing here. I'm going to do a grid search, and I'm going to say that, you know, all these parameters can take these three different values. So, you know, if I try to optimize all five parameters, that's a three power five number of possibilities. So it will cycle through all those possibilities, and it will pick the, the hyperparameters which give you the best, you know, or the lowest errors. So optimizing all these five hyperparameters takes a long time. So what I do is, for the time being, I'm just going to comment out these three lines, and I'm just going to optimize the number of estimators and the maximum depth. So if you guys can go ahead and do that, please uh, comment out these three lines and uh, make sure the, the first two are uncommented, the number of estimators and the maximum depth. So now my uh, parameter grid is not empty. I'm providing these values. And again, I will train the random forest regressor the exact same way as before, only now it has some parameters to take into account. And then it will you know, do the fitting, do the predicting, uh, print out the results, et cetera. So let's run this. This may take a few seconds, or it may even take up to a minute uh, uh, for this to run. So uh, we'll see uh, if, if, if the predictions change, uh, you know, when, uh, I go from training a, a default model to uh, an optimized model. So, so okay. So, this is the model that I get. So, the error didn't change a great deal. It, it only came down marginally. Uh, although the training error did increase, which is, you know, slightly better. Like, you know, that the training error isn't super good and the test error is, is not that great. That's not a situation you, you want to be in. So, here you can see that it did change from, from, the, from what you saw previously. So, you know, it gave me... Uh, you know, slightly better test uh, errors here. Uh, and I've also printed out, you know, so according to this model, the, the maximum depth should be 10 and the number of estimators should be 50. So, okay. So, you know, uh, you know, that's what it tells me. Now, I, we can do another run. Let's, let's, you know, not optimize these two, but let's optimize the next two parameters. Let's optimize maximum features and minimum samples leaf. So, these two parameters. And let's run again. Let's see if, if you know, this gives me something else. Uh, okay, not sure. Okay, so, you know, it, it ran, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I think the errors are not converging. Maybe that's that's the error that I'm getting here. But again, you know, these are the results that it it gives me. So, you know, it doesn't uh, particularly improve the, the, the prediction. So, uh, basically, what I want to say here is that you can play around with the different parameters and, you know, you can you can use the different parameters. Uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say if I want to optimize the maximum depth, 
and the minimum sample split. So I, I can run this again. So, you know, this will take a few seconds and give me uh, a prediction again. So, you know, you can optimize all of them together. You can optimize some of them, like, you know, I mean, in the end, you do need to optimize all of them. So, you know, it will take longer. But, you know, I, I optimized two particular parameters, the maximum depth and the minimum sample split, and it gives me these, these predictions. So, so this is what I get uh, from a random forest model by doing hyperparameter optimization. So next, I want to demonstrate what happens when I incorporate cross-validation. So cross-validation is something that is extremely important. So, you know, I'm going to use five-fold cross-validation here. You can change this to, you know, eight-fold, 10-fold, 20-fold, whatever. You can try out different folds of cross-validation. There are other types of cross-validation as well, but I'm just using n-fold cross-validation here. So as I said, it divides the training data into n sets. It uses n minus sets at a time to train the model and, you know, makes a prediction on the left outset and it, it this, it does this over and over. So uh, here I have provided all my different hyperparameters and I'm asking it to do five-fold cross-validation. So this particular cell takes several minutes to run. So I am not going to run this, but I have run this before and this is what I get. So uh, you, know, you can see that the errors are uh, obviously much better. So I've gone from 0.5 EV errors to you know, less than 0.4 EV errors here because I optimized all five hyperparameters. So I cycled through all of them and I used five-fold cross-validation, which takes care of the overfitting problem. So there is neither overfitting nor underfitting really happening here. And it looks like I'm sort of converging to the best possible results I can get. Although clearly you can see some of the points are predicted poorly. So in practice, what I would do is I may go and look at those particular points and see, is there something going on with those particular impurities? Is there, you know, uh, you know, maybe my calculations have some problems, etc. So, you know, that's what I might do at that stage. But, you know, as of now, my best possible random forest model by doing hyperparameter optimization and cross-validation gives me a test error of 0.39 EV and a training error of 0.26 EV. Okay, so going forward, uh, I can use um, I can use other types of techniques as well. I can use neural networks, I can use Gaussian process, etc. So I'm not going to go into too many of these, but uh, I'm just going to show kernel ridge regression. So I talked about this uh, in the in the slides. Uh, kernel ridge regression is a similarity based method where you know you define your property as a uh, summation over these Gaussians, which takes into account uh, the uh, sum of uh, distances between all the points in your data set. So the two parameters that we optimize here are alpha and uh, you know these uh, kernel uh, values or the Gaussian uh, kernel values, uh, the, the parameters. So I provide different ranges again for, for these different parameters and I use grid search CV. I call the kernel ridge uh, function here and I provide these parameters and I do five-fold cross-validation. And in the same way, I perform fitting and I perform uh, predicting and uh, I save the predicted data set. I print out the errors and I plot the results. So this will also take a few minutes to run. So I'm not going to run it now, but I have already run it before. And uh, this is what I get. So here uh, I see that actually I improve my performances even more uh, as compared to the random forest prediction. So here, uh, you know, with the with kernel ridge regression, I get uh, a test uh, a root mean square error of about 0.32 EV. Uh, the best error with random forest was 0.39 EV, and the training uh, the training error is pretty similar. So. You know, so I am able to get pretty good models with kernel ridge regression. So at this stage, I may decide to use the kernel ridge regression model going forward because it seems to work well. Uh, another model I demonstrate here is lasso regression. Again, I specify some parameters. I train the model as before. So, you know, this is not important, but just as a comparison, I have already run this model and I get higher errors here. So this is more, of, again, more of a linear regression model, but it, you know, uh, it shrinks some of your unimportant features. So, you know, it, it gives me a prediction, but it's not uh, anywhere as good as the random forest or the kernel uh, predictions. So I get pretty decent models with both KRR and random forest. And that's, you know, what I can use going forward. So I'm uh, coming towards the end of, of some of these things here. So in the remaining cells, what I want to do now is, you know, now I have trained my model. I have some models that I've trained. So I want to use these models to make predictions on these outside cases. So specifically, these outside predictions on the alloy data uh, that I had. So, you know, that's what I read as X out. And then I read these X all uh, data, which was, you know, the data on every possible point in your data set. So you can make predictions on everything outside. So this X out predictions actually helps me make comparisons because I have 
NFT calculations done for those as well. So I can see if these models that I train, if they can work well for these alloy data points, which are sort of different, but still in the same chemical space. So, you know, we can see if these models work or not. So I'm going to use my best uh, random Horace regression model here. So you can, uh, you know, uh, change this quantity to, uh, you may have to uh, to, 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 to provide RF reg opt as, as, as your uh, value here, because you uh, may not have read, uh, you may not have run this uh, best model that, that, that I'm talking about. So, uh, if if you are running along with me, please, you know, do this, uh, you know, write this line reg opt uh, is equal to RF reg opt. So, you know, basically it, it will take the random forest regression that you've done so far. It will read that and it will make the prediction. So, you know, I'm going to use the, the best model, which is what I got from doing cross validation and everything. And uh, I'm going to run this and it, it makes the predictions on these outside points. So it will take a few seconds. Uh, okay. Uh, there are some errors here. Okay, so, you know, it looks like the dimensions are not matching, so I may not have read the, the correct dimensions for the outside points. So I'm just going to go back up for a second and look at these data points again. Uh, so I'm reading these. Reading. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it does look like I read the right one, but, you know, uh, I'll have to look at what the error is. But uh, to, to avoid that, what I can do is uh, let me try to run this RF like opt. Uh, so yeah, so that does run. Okay, so so you know there's something wrong with the best regressor that I was using personally on on my machine. So you know if you just use this line re regression opt is equal to RF reg opt. So so that takes your optimized uh, random forest regressor and it makes the predictions and it uses the predicted uh, model the the trained model to make predictions on these outside data sets. So it's it's done. So you know I ran that and it's done. So now. Uh, you know, if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to uh, predict error bars or uncertainties in your prediction, so I I I, I use a 95 percentile uh, uh, to use uh, to to get my error bars. So as I said, you you can you can do this. So I'm only going to show this for for random forest. So you can do this by uh, you know uh, I, yeah, using the standard deviation of predictions over all the trees that you have, you know, you may have 50 trees or 100 trees or whatever, like, uh, you know, we optimized here. So so that's what you can use here. So again, I'm not going to use this best uh, regression, but, you know, if you can just uncomment everything and just comment this one. So here I'm just calling a random forest regressor uh, and I'm telling it to, you know, compute these uh, 95 percentile errors for me. So if, if you can comment out the other lines and uncomment this line and you run this, so it should, uh, you know, give the error bars here. Okay, so it, it's done running and it gives the error bars. So in, in the next few cells, uh, these are not very important, but uh, I'm just going to say what they are. I, I, I divide my data by, you know, what is the semiconductor type, whether it's cattel, cat cell, or cadmium sulfide. So that's what is happening in this section. And in the next cell, it, it divides this data by semiconductor type, but it includes these error bars. So the previous cell is for when you don't have error bars. This cell is for when you do have error bars. So that's what I can run here. So now it has divided my data, uh, you know, so it, it has all the predicted uh, training for cattle, test for cattle, training for cat cell, test for cat cell, error bars for cat cell, et cetera. So it has divided all my data into training types. And after I've done that, what I can do here is print out errors with respect to semiconductor type, which would help us look at, you know, whether some semiconductors are doing better than the others. So for example, when I run this, it tells me that the total uh, test uh, root mean square error is 0.5 and train root mean square error is 0.33. And, you know, but the errors are actually pretty good for cattel, but not as good for cat cell, selenide and cat sulfide. So this is something to keep in mind. Maybe we need more data of those types, or, you know, maybe we need some other descriptors which can improve those. So keep in mind that this is not my best model. So, you know, because I was getting that error, I'm using the, the previous uh, random forest model and not the best random forest model. And it also gives you the predictions on these outside points, which are these alloys, cadmium telluride selenide and cadmium selenide sulfide, and it gives you the root mean square errors. The final cell here is, uh, you know, where I plot these uh, these uh, uh, final results along with the error bar. So I have not plotted the error bar so far. So this is what I get. 
So I plot my final results, and you know these are the test and training uh, root mean square errors like before. And now I have error bars for all the test points, training points. And now, in addition to the test and training points, I'm plotting these outside points, which are these alloys. So you know, once again, I would emphasize that the true power of these machine learning algorithms is to make predictions for new cases. So these cadmium tellurite selenide and cadmium selenide sulfide compounds are new cases which are not seen by the model at all. So these are the red and green points, and you can see that largely these predictions are pretty good. The, the root mean square error is slightly higher. They are 0.56 EV, but they are still pretty good. Uh, you know, so you can make these predictions with, with, you know, given the range of values, these are less than 10% errors. So you can actually get pretty good errors on both, you know, the, the, the test points and the outside points. So I think that is the end of the notebook. I'm going to go back to my slides in, in a second. So, you know, uh, please go through all these cells and I will look at the questions that you guys have. Uh, I think uh, Ali did ask me to leave some time for the questions. So that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, just to, uh, you know, finish up my slides, you know, these are some learning curves that we get, you know, where we determine that using the elemental properties is not good enough and we want to use elemental and unit cell properties together and we can minimize these errors as a function of the training set size. These are the best possible models that we get, you know, for uh, these formation enthalpies or formation energies uh, for both cadmium rich and X rich conditions. Similarly, these are models for the beauty transition levels, which I did not demonstrate. I just looked at the formation energies. But here we actually see that the elemental properties seem to work very well too. So just for the transition levels, we are able to utilize the elemental properties, but not really for the formation energies. And these are the best possible random forest models we get for the transition levels, both the training and test points and the outside points. Uh, and finally, we can make these uh, formation energy versus Fermi level plots. These solid lines that you see here are DFT predictions and the dotted lines are machine learning predictions. So you can see that generally these machine learning predictions match up pretty well. They can at least qualitatively give you the correct information, whether it's high energy or low energy, whether it has a transition level in the band gap, et cetera. So we have gone from this data set of a few hundred impurities and we have made predictions on almost 2,000 new impurities in, in all these compounds. And currently we are extending this work. So we have extended this to, from cat tail, cat cell, et cetera, to a lot more two, six, three, five, and four, four uh, semiconductors, a lot more impurities. Uh, we also use advanced uh, theories like modified band alignment and hybrid HSC functionals to, to, you know, to make these predictions even better. So this is, you know, sort of the extension of the work. And this is just an acknowledgement of the funding and computing resources that were used for this work. So, okay. So uh, I think uh, this is a good time for me to answer questions now. Uh, since we are we are right at the end, I'm going to maybe stop sharing and uh, I will let uh, you guys tell me about any questions uh, that I can answer now. Well, thanks uh, for an excellent uh, workshop, Arun. Uh, this is really great. Um, I'm going to ask Saket to see if there's any uh, questions from the Q&A that, that he would like to highlight. So, Saket, any sure. good questions that Arun can uh, address? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a couple of questions which I'll club in and say. Uh, so, while running this notebook, uh, different people got different RMSE, or, well, error values. Uh, could that be because of a seed, a random seed somewhere? Uh, and if so, then what is the range of the errors that you expect with these models? Right. So that is exactly because of the range. So when we are doing this training test split, it's taking a random seed value. And, you know, that is going to be different for everyone. So so when, when I run it again, I will get different results. So the way to solve this is, so, you know, what is the range of errors that you expect? That is something that we have to go in and, and check. So, uh, you know, I, I showed this uh, uh, learning curve where I'm using, uh, you know, uh, where, where I'm uh, uh, plotting the, the error as a function of the training uh, set size. So here, for example, if if I if I choose uh, 600 training points and I train a model, you see there is an error bar here for you know for the root mean square error. So this is because I train it over 100 different models. So I do 100 different training test splits, or maybe I do 1,000 different training test splits. 
So uh, to, to do this rigorously, you have to get statistics over a lot of different splits. So you want to uh, do this 80-20 split, you know, many times, 100 times, 1,000 times, even more. And you want to look at the range of predictions. So your predictions should fall in a certain range. It, it shouldn't be that, you know, your predictions are very, very awful for, for some cases and very, very good for some other cases. That's not likely to happen. And that shouldn't happen because that would mean there is something wrong, you know, with your or parameters or with your data set, uh, et cetera. So uh, the way to do this is to, you know, to, to, to do this over many different runs and get, you know, some sort of an averaged prediction. So I, for demonstration purposes, I just ran it a single time. But I would be running this thousands of times and I would be getting like an average prediction. And, you know, that is the model that I would report. Like, you know, on average, my prediction error seems to be 0.4 EV on the test set, 0.5 EV on the outside set, uh, outside set, whatever. So, so you know that that's what uh, I will say uh, in in answer to that. And absolutely, I expect everyone to get different predictions, different root mean square errors. Awesome. So, um, yeah. Maybe a super quick question and answer. Uh, super quick question. Okay, super quick question here. Um, if you, if you're using PB to predict the charge transition levels, are you using a band gap correction? Uh, yes, very, very, very good uh, question. So, so that is someone who is familiar with the defect calculations. So, uh, in the in this particular case, we did not use a band gap correction. We use the the bandages that we get from the PB calculations. However, we we uh, plot these uh, defect formation energies or defect levels over. We span it across the experimental band gap. So, there there is some literature that we cited in the in, in this paper where uh, they talk about how. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, since these defect transition levels are based on energy differences and not, you know, explicit, you know, cone charm energy levels, the energy differences come out to be slightly more accurate than, you know, you, you would think. So, so there is some logic to, you know, to, to spreading these defect transition levels across the experimental band gap. So that is what we are using here. And the plot that I showed where I'm comparing the PV transition levels with the experimentally observed defect levels, that is how I plotted that. So I'm just, you know, taking, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, transition level values based on what I get from PB, but I'm spanning it across the experimental band gap. So that is, you know, a matter of contention and something that we can discuss more. So whoever asked that question, please feel free to write to me and we can talk about that more. All right. So in the interest uh, of time, let's uh, stop here. Let's thank uh, Arun again for an awesome presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating. Stay well. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ali and Sarkit. Yeah. All right. Good. Bye. Bye.